So hello everyone and welcome to this practice webinar. My name is Joel Matlisky and let me make sure that we have James also on the line. James, are you with us? Uh, yes. Can you hear me? We can hear you loud and clear. Just thanks for joining everyone. Um, I'm Joel from practice and I have here uh, James. Uh, James, do you want to present yourself? I, even though I think that everyone actually knows you. Uh, my name is James Bach. <laughs> I am a testing consultant an author, and I uh, like to talk about what I call rapid software testing. Cool, so my name is Joel, and I'm, also, I'm not a testing consultant, I'm actually, I'm a tester, let me just move this here. I work for a company called Practitest, and I am Practitest Chief Solution Architect. And um, the idea behind this webinar, just to give you a short intro, and then we'll start with the, with the flow, was that um, because of our tool, because of, of basically we're talking to customers all the time within the company, then there are always tons and tons of questions around exploratory testing. And I have the honor of knowing James for a number of years. I'm not going to say how many. And I asked him if we could do a Q&A session around um, the topic of exploratory testing. And um, he agreed, and that was pretty, pretty cool in itself. And when we went out and, and started asking que people to send us their questions, um, Basically, we realized that there were two types of questions, I can say, that James, you, you'll tell me if you agree or not. Those that were focused on people who are already doing exploratory testing and might have, let's say, fine-tuning questions, how to do it better. But some questions really showed that for some people, they're not 100% aligned with what exploratory testing actually means or the concept of, of testing in general and exploratory testing and the concept of, of testing. And, and so... What we thought, actually, James, James came with the idea is let's first of all give an introduction, <clears throat> general introduction to exploratory testing to make sure that we're all on the same page. And afterwards, we can actually go into the more concrete uh, questions uh, in them. We're on the same page, James? Okay. Now, just a second before you start, I have my stuff that I need to cover. So first of all, a um, little bit about practice test, and I need to do this. Sorry for that for those who want to jump into exploratory testing. It's a QA management tool. Uh, these are the guys who are actually arranging this. And if you don't have a tool or you want to switch tools, go ahead and try it out. I'm not going to go too much into the details, but there's a free evaluation, and we really, really love it. By the way, it also has support for exploratory testing that we're even improving based on tons of feedback right now. Last thing before we move into the actual stuff, there is an online test conf that I am the chair of. It is happening on the 27th and 28th of November. It's a pretty cool thing, even if I say it myself, because we get some pretty amazing talks in these two days, and we have a lot of interactions around testers. It's free. Go to www.onlinetestconf.com, sign up. It's a real, real cool place to, to talk testing and learn testing. And... Uh, I guess that we're ready to start talking about Well, Joel, you didn't say why I'm here. I mean, you said what we're going to do, but I think, I think I need to say a couple of things about why I'm here. Go for it, uh, man. I'm here because uh, I had an argument with you, and then you used kung fu psychology to make me really like you uh, during our argument. <laughs> and... <laughs> And respect you for being a, a, a man of grace and integrity. And then you showed me a tool, which I had, the tool you just referred to, which I had a lot of problems with. But I complained about the tool to you, and you were so good at listening to my uh, concerns about it that when you asked me to do this uh, and you offered to pay me, I refused to accept payment. <laughs> because I really want to help your company and I want to make sure that people know that uh, I'm doing this because I believe in practice test. Even though I have concerns about your tool and I want to see it improved, I think you really are on the path to making a tool that's going to do the world a lot of good. Man, thanks. That really means a lot. And um, well, yeah, I actually not forget about it, but so it was out of focus. But yeah, guys, and, and again, as Jane said, we have quite a lot of road ahead of us. But if there's something that I like about the company that I work with is that we do not believe that we know all the truth. And if it's asking real experts like James what they think, or even listening to customers, meaning how are they abusing our system 
because they need to, then, then that's what we do. And, and we're always happy to do it as a company. So that's, that's long and short of it. Okay. Okay, man. Let's get, let's get into ET. I think that's okay. what people really want to hear about. Okay. Uh, here we go. I have about a 530-word statement that I'm going to read in dramatic fashion Jesus, to man. tightly explain ready. what ET is. Here we go. <laughs> there are lots of people, the ISTQB people especially, who spread incorrect and Hello. Okay, guys, this is something that James told me might happen. It was popularized wait, by wait, James. me. James, I... James, wait a second. You were off from about the first sentence. So oh. I think that you should start from the top. And I was explaining to people, let me just say it out loud. James is connecting from an hotel in Portugal. So if he goes offline for a minute or two, bear with him. He will <laughs> reconnect immediately, he promised me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, from the top, I, I have an internet. Wait, it's try it again. Uh, yeah. All right. Let's try it so again. There are, there are lots of people, the ISTQB people in particular, who spread, in my view, incorrect and incorrect. We're losing James for a little bit. And then it was popularized by me in the 90s. And I've been teaching it since 1993. So I've been teaching ET a long, long time. Well, I will tell you that when we said exploratory testing, when that term was coined, we were talking about testing that was under the control of the tester as the tester was performing a particular test. And you can also call this informal testing. Okay, now the opposite of testing that is under your control is testing that is not under your control, and we called that scripted testing. And another word for scripted testing is formal testing. So to formalize something is to stop doing it in just any way you want, and instead, to do it in one specific way, which is a scripted way. All right, now, in the early 2000s, we came to realize that whenever humans do testing, it always involves unspoken and unwritten knowledge and abilities. These elements are always under the control of the tester to some degree. Furthermore, no testing can be reasonable, acceptable, and good enough without these unwritten and unscriptable elements. So we know this based on sociology, epistemology, and neuroscience, which are three fields the ISTQB people don't talk about and don't want to read about. Now, follow me on this. If all testing involves tacit knowledge and skill, and this cannot be scripted, that means that all testing is exploratory testing to some degree. But testing also involves structures, habits, and biases that constrain our freedom. We may often give up some of our choices in order to achieve a specific goal with our testing. Therefore, all testing is also scripted testing to some degree. So let me summarize. Exploratory testing is not something you do in your spare time. All testing is exploratory and all testing is scripted to some degree. Some testing is very exploratory and other testing is very scripted. So there's a continuum of formality from very informal to very formal. The question is not, when do you do exploratory testing, but rather how exploratory is your testing and how scripted is your testing and why? Now, there are pros and cons of being on different parts of that formality continuum. Informal testing allows you to quickly discover many kinds of bugs, but it may be less reliable about doing some specific test. Formal testing allows you to be more confident that you did a specific test, but 
your testing is likely to be more shallow and more narrow because formalizing is expensive and inflexible. Although it's not possible to completely formalize and script a testing process, you can completely formalize an output checking process. Most of the so-called test cases that people try to automate are really automated regression output checks. There's a lot of value to output checking. I use output checking and I automate output checking. And checking is part of testing. Okay, so I'm not, I'm not criticizing checking. I'm just saying that checking alone is not a replacement for the thoughtful and searching process of human thoughtful testing, which is going to be exploratory to some degree. So here's an important truth about formal testing. And when I say this, realize that I have done some of the most formal testing that anyone in the industry has ever done. And I can say that because I've tested as part of legal proceedings in a court of law, which is very expensive, very, very formal testing. And I can tell you that all the formal testing I've done that's any good always began as informal testing. It started as informal testing, and then as I worked with it, I formalized it until it was really good formal testing. I didn't just teleport into formality by dreaming up a test case off the top of my head. I played, I tried things, I experimented. That's how I created my scripted testing. All right, that's my statement. Now I'm ready to answer questions. <laughs> now, just to add this, because we were talking about it yesterday, and I actually used this argument earlier. To go out of script here, uh, and again, I think that it was pretty nice because I, I did use it earlier today. I think that we talked about testing basically like driving a car when we were talking yesterday, James. And yes. you said that, that in a sense, when you drive a car, sometimes you can actually use Waze or some navigating system, Google Maps, whatever. Or sometimes you can actually go uh, driving based on the, uh, on the route, on the way that you know it. But regardless, if you're driving through ways or routing, there will always be things that you will need to use human behavior for. Okay, if it's going to be avoiding a pedestrian or a tree or a hole in the, in the road, even when you're using ways, sometimes you can say, hey, you know what? I think that this other path is going to be better. And that's a pretty good analogy to testing. You can have a script, but you will better keep your eyes open because there are going to be things to notice that are outside of your script. And sometimes it's perfectly okay just to navigate outside of your script if you think that that's the path that you should be taking right now. Uh, yeah, driving is a wonderful analogy uh, because all driving is exploratory to some degree and all driving is scripted to some degree. You're constrained in what you do. You pretty much have to stay on the road, for instance, and there are road signs and that sort of thing. But if it's the middle of the night and you pull up to an empty intersection and there's a stoplight, a lot of times we just go, oh, well, there's no one around. I can just go through the stoplight. Uh, and that's the exploratory <laughs> way. If that's taking control of the situation. And if there's a disaster or something and you have to drive over somebody's lawn in order to escape a fire, you're going to do that. But an automated car is not going to do that, is not going to break laws like that, even if there's a fire. Okay, That's by the way, why I, th I think that, that automated cars are, uh, are dangerous. Uh, Practitus does not agree with the fact that James Bach has just said that you can actually run a stoplight, nor do we encourage people to do that, I have to say. Um, <laughs> you know, legal stuff. You know how okay. it's operations. Okay, guys. Now, first thing first, and we'll start going over questions. I do want to apologize. At the beginning, me and James said, hey, if people don't ask questions, we'll just come up with some. Um, and we literally got hundreds of them. I'm not kidding. I joke you not. We went over hundreds of questions. The good thing is that many of them repeated themselves. And many of them were around the same areas. So what we try to do is basically to summarize these questions or pick one that was representative or, or come up with one that actually summarizes some of them. We will start going over them. By the way, another question that was just asked, yes, we are recording the session. Yes, we will share it with people later on. OK, so if you're just joined or you need to leave or you want to share this with your peers or Twitter developers, 
um, we will get it. Now, I have here my phone that I need to check with the phone question. So the first question that I want to ask here, James, is um, what are some lightweight structures that can bring a little formality but still allow you lots of freedom while exploratory testing? I'll tell you about two of them. One is called the test session and one is called the test charter. Now a test session is just a block of time, which I like to have as an uninterrupted block of time, wherein testing happens. And if you have a standardized notion of this block of time, um, in my case, I generally go 90 minutes, 90 minutes of uninterrupted testing time. I call that a session. Then what you can do is you can count sessions, which makes a lot more sense than counting test cases. You can say, I did 10 test sessions, and that actually means something because that's 90 minutes times 10 of actually trying to get your hands around something and test it instead of saying 10 test cases. And you don't know, 10 test cases could be a huge amount of work. Test, test, 10 test cases could be a tiny little thing. Uh, you don't know when people count test cases. So a test session gives you a kind of a structure that you can use to plan your testing because it turns out if you use 90 minute test sessions, you could basically plan on doing three sessions per day. And that means that you can look out over a course of you know, weeks and say, well, basically I have you know, 52 test sessions that I'm gonna be able to do during that time. And then you can say, where do I wanna put those test sessions? Do I wanna test this? Do I wanna test that? I've got 52 different little poker chips that I can move around. Now the test charter goes with test sessions, although you don't, you don't need to use them with test sessions. A test charter is a brief statement about how you are about to use a period of time. So you can say, I'm gonna do testing of the uh, password recovery feature of my website. That's my charter. And the charter doesn't tell you how to do it. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't say what all the steps are. You could have fairly detailed charters. I've worked with charters that are up to a page long that control an entire day of testing. And I've worked with charters that are one word long. <laughs> so you can, you can uh, think of charters in a lot of different ways. But the idea of a charter is just to give you a focus and to be able to explain that focus to somebody else later on, especially they go well with sessions because you can say, I did 10 sessions and that's 10 different charters and here are my charters for those sessions. And if you're dealing with people who do a lot of stuff with test cases, they think that's fine because they think you're telling them test cases and it's something that they're, that they're used to, but you're really using charters and it's really exploratory. Now, one of the things that, that I think go along, first of all, I comment that, that popped to mind. I think that the, the length of the, of the session, it's something that is, in a sense, very personal. I know that for me, to concentrate on a specific thing for over 45 minutes uninterruptedly, it's almost impossible. So my, my sessions are 45 minutes. I do know for people that are, go longer than that, but I think that that is very, very personal. I think that you should basically try to find what is your session length, your optimal session length, that you can still be concentrated. So, so that's one of the things that I, I would still put. Well, not only that, but uh, for some kinds of testing, uh, longer sessions are very natural. For instance, if I'm doing a review of some documentation, I tend to sit for a long time in one place pouring over the documentation. Uh, that's, that's a lot different from trying to work on some uh, stress testing or something like that, where I'm trying to run around and find a, a, a person who can help me set up a, a, a virtual machine, you know? So, uh, so it's not just personal, it also has to do with the kind of work you happen to be doing at that moment. Uh, so uh, what I did when I created session-based test management is we just, we had some sessions that were longer and some that were shorter, but we normalized everything 90 minute session. So if I did uh, three uh, shorter sessions, then I might put them together and, and say, well, that's really two sessions worth of time. So we'll call it two sessions on the metrics, even though it was actually three different 
sessions. It's, it's equivalent to two sessions worth of testing uh, because of the time. And a lot of people just use hours. They just say, well, we don't need to count sessions. Let's just count testing hours and say we did X number of, of uninterrupted testing hours. And then your sessions can be as short or as long as you want. But if you make them too short, you don't really get into the testing. So you, you need to find a way to, to make sure you, you, get, you get some productivity going before you interrupt yourself. Now, you did something very nonchalantly, and that is that you just threw in the air the, the concept of, of SVTM, of session-based test management. And I guess that just as with exploratory session, for some people it might be, yeah, I know of, of SVTM for a long time. Some people might not even be aware of it. So do you want to explain what is SVTM, given that you and I well, think just, John actually came up with yeah, it? Just briefly, uh, session-based test management is a system for managing testing that my brother and I invented in the year 2000 when we were working for Hewlett Packard. And Hewlett Packard wanted us to put together this exploratory test team that would, that would do whatever they felt like doing each day but then when we actually put the team together, HP management kept asking us, where are your test cases? Where are your test cases? And at first I said, shut up. <laughs> we don't use test cases. <laughs> Every time they, they said that, I just said, we don't have any, you know, lump it. But after a <laughs> while, my brother and I, we were having dinner and, and once, and we said, you know, it, we feel bad that we have to keep telling these people no. I mean, we, we, we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, and they keep forgetting what they hired us to do. But, but maybe there is a way that we could do something like test cases, but still keep all of the exploratory freedom that we want, right? So that's when we came up with the session idea uh, to, to be able to, to create metrics and to have documentation. So in session-based test management, you have sessions. Each session has a document associated with it, which is your test notes. The session has a standardized length of time, or if not, then you count the actual time and you add up the, the actual time. And we're, you make sure you're talking about uninterrupted time because if you just say, oh, I did eight hours of testing because I was at work for eight hours, that doesn't mean anything you might have been talking to people and not even testing for half that time. So we only counted the actual time that we were trying to test the product. And that way, when we got the metrics and we sent them to management, we weren't misleading management. And we also came up with the charters idea, which originally came from Kem Kaner, and uh, the name came from another guy. And so we put these ideas together, and we added one more element. Session-based test management also involves debriefings. So the test lead would talk to everyone after they do their test sessions and make sure that you understood their notes. And that discipline of having debriefing was important if we were going to do the metrics. Now, if you're not going to do the metrics, you don't need the debriefing, although I think it's still a pretty good idea to talk with somebody about the testing that you've done and make sure that you're not the only one who knows about that testing, but someone else can look at it and ask you questions and say, oh, I see what you tested, I get it. Because that way, if somebody leaves a team or if someone's sick or, you know, if someone's asked, someone outside the team's asking about the testing, then someone else besides the one person who did that testing knows what happened. I actually think that there's quite a lot more to debriefing. I like the fact that whenever I'm debriefing someone, even on my test, that's when the interesting questions come up. It's like, oh, you did this and this, is, but did you think about that? And you get the, oh, shit moments when you realize that you missed a big bug. Or also, I like the fact that after, during those debriefings, and that's something that I think that you, you taught me a long time ago, it's completely yeah. okay, even expected to reshuffle your charters because you were running yeah. a session and you found out that we have a very big, vulnerability on an area. So let's actually create two more charters and push them in and basically drop everything down based on priorities. And I think yeah. that's a great part of SPTM. Yeah, it, yeah, right. Another part of SPTM that relates to that is that if two people cooperate on the same session, they only create one set of notes, but that counts as two sessions. So that means that 
people are incentivized to help each other because there's less paperwork and they still get full credit for doing a session. Um, and the, the metrics uh, re reflect that. So it's a system that encourages people to talk with each other and to help each other uh, all throughout. Now, this is a great proxy for, for one of the questions. And there was a question about best practices around note taking. Okay, if, if you have any um, best practices when people are taking notes, how deep to go, how shallow to go, uh, how to gather evidence. Um, so uh, sure. what's your take on that? Well, I never, I never talk about best practices because I don't believe in them, but I'll talk about skills. I'll talk about practices. I'll talk about practices I like. How about that? Good enough. I don't know if it's a best practice, but it might be a practice I like. Here's a practice that I like. I like when we build into software automatic logging of how I tested the product on a functional level so that I don't have to take notes to a huge <laughs> amount uh, of degree, right? If if I have a function level logging in the system, then then the system tells me. It tells me how I tested it. It says you touch this thing and you touch that thing and you touch the other thing. And that logging is not hard to do. It's not hard to add. Now, if you don't have it though, on Windows, there is a particular program that's built into Windows called PSR. And if you've never heard this, go to your, your start menu right now and type PSR and you'll find that you have this tool called PSR. It stands for Problem Steps for Quarter and allows you to record what you do uh, for anything that you're doing on Windows. Now, it's not a perfect tool. There's a lot of problems with it. Um, I wish there were better tools uh, for this. There might actually be better tools uh, for this. Maybe Practitest has better tools for this. <laughs> but uh, uh, it, it does things like it saves screenshots, and, and it's uh, really nice that way. So uh, if we had tools, more of these tools, and they were better known, that makes note taking a lot easier but note taking is a skill you have to practice so here's a practice that's very important and that is practice practice your your note taking practice telling the testing story do some testing and then write a two paragraph summary of your testing and what i find is is the testers even with like 10 years experience most of them seem to have never tried to actually summarize 90 minutes of testing in two paragraphs. They've, they've had no practice at it. But once you practice for, oh, a couple of weeks, you get pretty good at it. You get to be able to, to say what your testing was in a way that you can come back to two months later and remember that test session. So practice is what I would uh, recommend uh, amongst uh, other things and uh, and better tools for recording or good logging will help you as well and one other thing that I'm going to suggest which I use in any high important situation such as when I've done testing for medical devices use video set up a video camera that watches everything that you do and save all the video you can do this because we have terabyte hard drives. I can save about 80 days of my testing on a one terabyte hard drive. And the terabyte hard drives don't hardly cost anything. So the great thing about that is even if there's a, a, a bug that happens that I can never reproduce, I have it on video. I saw it happen and it's on video so I can show it to the developers. And if I ever need to know what testing I did on August 1st, I just go back to my video. And what that means is, is that nobody, no manager can say, we can't let you decide how you're going to test every, every day because then we don't know how you've tested. I go, you know everything about how I've tested because I have it all on video. Okay. And I have the log files. By the way, one of the things that I do use quite a lot is Jing by TechSmith. Uh, oh, yeah. It's a free tool. And by the way, it started only by capturing images, but right now they're capturing image uh, video as well. And it's pretty cool. Works on, works on my uh, Mac. It works from Win Windows as well. It's a pretty, pretty nice Jing tool. Jing is good. I used to use BB Test Assistant, uh, but I, I, I'm always worried using a software-based tool because they can crash. 
and then you lose all your video. But I've never had a video camera crash and lose all my video. Oh, Maybe it can, could happen, but I've never, never you, had it happen. You can use your iPhone. By the way, regarding uh, note taking, and this is one of the things that I do tell people when they're, they're taking notes, is remember that note taking, it's so, I'm not going to say a science, but you need to approach it, meaning remember that you take notes for positive things that you didn't and worked, obviously, for negative things that you didn't, didn't work. But if an idea pops up or a question pops up, everything, it's a log. It's a log. Basically, what I like to do when I'm taking notes is flush in my mind as, as things pop to it. So if I thought well, about... That, yeah. yeah, Joel, that's what I meant by you need to know how to tell the testing story. Now, a lot of people just don't even know enough about testing. They haven't thought about it enough. They might intuitively know it, but they don't know it in their conscious mind enough to know what to say about testing. So let me give you a you know, few ideas. Mm -hmm. like you want to talk about what you looked at. That's coverage. What did I examine? You need to say something about the kinds of tests that you performed. That is to say, were they stress tests? Were they um, boundary tests? Were they happy path? Were they positive? Were they negative? So those kinds of terms can be, can be helpful as well. Uh, say something about your test data. A lot of times people ignore test data, but test data is enormously important. One of the things that I always want to know is, well, if you use the file, where is that file? I mean, what if we, we want to go back and, and, and do more testing with that file you used? Where is it? Don't lose track of it. So I want to know about your test data, your coverage, um, and also your oracles. An oracle is how did you recognize bugs? How did you know that you, if there was a bug or not? Did you use any special tool? Did you use, did, were you just comparing it to the spec? Were you using an example from real life? You're like, how were you, what kinds of bugs were you looking for? In other words, that's what, what, that's what oracles tell you. So you've got to know how to tell a little story about what you were trying to do. Now, one simple way, very simple way to do this, very briefly, is to have a charter. The charter might say, I'm, I tried to test the, the password recovery feature of my website, for instance. And then you can just have something in your notes that says, all the ways in which you didn't do that. <laughs> So you can say, okay, did I, did I test the password recovery feature? And you might think and go, well, I sort of did. I did mostly, but there's more stuff I think I should have done that I haven't had time to do yet. So then put that down. Say, I, I did, did the charter, but there's a few things that I think that I still need to do, and those things are X, Y, and Z. And then you put that in your notes. And that way... That way, it's very compact, and later on, you can go back and say, oh, I did a test session on password recovery, so I did test that. Oh, but wait, it says here I didn't test everything. There were some things I forgot to test, or I, or I didn't have time to test. So, so it, was, it was good testing except for this, and, and that can be a very, kind of, a very helpful kind of note to take. In addition to that, write down any, uh, any issues, bugs, ideas that, that, that came to you while, while doing that testing. Yeah, one of the things that for me used to be a very big issue, I used to start a test case, use exploratory testing without taking notes. All of a sudden I think about another test and I start just going over it and I forget about the first charter that I started with. And, oh, and, yeah, know, that's you, built you start, into SBTM. You start, you start a million things and that was what we were talking about, thread-based testing yesterday. But, um, but what I started doing is, hey, don't follow that test, just write it down. You won't forget it, but don't go out of your existing charter because you don't want to miss it. You're, you're doing that for a session. Well, that's the, in SBTM, we actually designed that into it, and we have a name for that. We, we called that opportunity testing. And what we said in the original protocol of SBTM is part of the magic of exploratory testing is you as a tester might come across something that you realize is more important than your charter. So you can deviate and you can, you can do that testing instead. Then, then when you're, when you're uh, putting your notes together, you say, 
uh, we had a place in our uh, our chart our uh, reporting format where we could say that I was 80% on charter and 20% on opportunity. And that just meant that 20% of your time was spent doing something other than the charter. Now, if you, if you were more than 50% on opportunity, what we told people to do is change your charter to fit whatever it was you were doing. And then you can go back up to, you know, 80% or 100%. And then you still have your original charter that you still need to do a test session for. So, so I'm not saying, you know, abandon your charter. I'm saying maybe you'll find something more important to do and you'll postpone your charter until the afternoon. You know, that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's a bad thing if you think you've tested something or if you say you've tested something, but you didn't test it because you got distracted. That's the, that's the problem is, is uh, false reporting. So don't, don't do any false reporting. Okay. Now, we're talking very nice and I love these chats, but I think that we need to cover some additional questions. Okay. Um, there's a good one here that actually came a number of times in a number of, of different ways. How do you teach exploratory testing uh, for people who are doing an occasional testing role. I'd like, to, I'd like everyone in my Agile team to perform exploratory tests, but I'm not sure if, it, if this is even feasible in real life. Well, good news. It's quite easy to do because mostly what you're trying to do is getting people to unlearn things that aren't helpful. Uh, what, they're try what you're trying to get people to do really is to turn their brains on just like their brains were turned on when they were a kid and they were learning to play with a new toy. Uh, you don't have to instruct a child how to play with a toy. In fact, there's research that shows that if you instruct a child about how to play with a toy, they don't play with it in very many different ways. But if you don't tell a child how to play with a toy, they play with it in a lot of different ways. They have more variety in their interactions with that toy when they're not told what to do with it. So what I do is I bring people in and I say, listen, all you need to know is there are problems in this product. And I'll tell you the kinds of problems that the team is most concerned about. This kind of problem, this kind of problem, and this kind of problem. Your job is in the next four hours while you're eating the pizza that we brought for you or whatever it is that refreshments that make it fun. It, your job is to find as many problems as you can, especially in these categories. And we've set everything up. And the other thing that's important to do is to minimize the paperwork because instead of teaching people how to make a good bug report, what's much better is to have the person who knows about testing write all the bug reports. And what you do is you just have a, a, in the room or in your area, you just tell people, you know, raise your hand or ring a bell or I've done this with hotel bells, like those bells on the desk. The uh, that can the be annoying ones. Yes. very annoying. They can be very annoying, but they can also build energy in the room. Um, you could do it with texting. If you have a, a, a one of those big open areas and people are using Slack, they can say, I found a bug, come over and see it. And then the, the expert, the tester can go around, the lead can go around and say, well, let me see it. Uh, and they can say, oh, well, that's not really a bug. Uh, but thanks for reporting it. If you see anything else weird, you let me know. Or they can say, oh, that's an important bug. Let's reproduce it. Let me write it up. And the important thing is, is that you don't give paperwork to part-time people because they just, they don't want to do paperwork. The fun part of testing is to try to try to find the hidden problem. That's the fun part. So if you're going to deal with part-timers, then emphasize the fun part of testing, the part that's the intellectual puzzle solving and the search for the, for the, the, the hidden bug. And then you try to minimize all of that other stuff that is important for record keeping, but, uh, uh, but might, uh, might slow everybody down. So I've done events 
uh, for testing medical devices, for instance, where I've had a room full of people and then we got a couple of developers and a couple of people from the test team and there were 25 people who were volunteering from different projects and we brought them into the room and it was a real party atmosphere and the developers were wandering around watching people and seeing what happened and then trying to troubleshoot right there and the testers were wandering around and everyone had fun and uh, uh, we found a whole lot of problems. And then we wrote down, you know, we report, reported the problems that mattered, but, but those were reported by the, the people who were ready to do the reporting, who were the, who were the full timers or the people who were dedicated testers. Don't expect people who are not dedicated testers to be very interested or very good at that kind of reporting. But then let me take you to another place. This is great for a, for a test, for a bug bash or, or a bug hunter. Again, it doesn't really matter how you call it, the, the, those events. But what happens, and I was actually in LA, um, Jesus, I got here two days ago, I think, uh, from, from Star West, and I went to a, to a meetup, uh, actually an Agile developers meetup, and we were talking testing there. And the question came, hey, how can I teach my developers to do exploratory testing? Is it even possible to do it, especially when you have Agile teams that we oh. have one testing specialist, we have yeah. five programmers, and okay. these guys will need to test. All How right, that's a that? different problem. And uh, the different problem that you have with when you're dealing with developers is that, uh, well, there's two categories. There are the developers who didn't write the software, and then there are the developers who did write the software. And you have a different okay. challenge with each of those. If you have developers who didn't write the software, you still have a, an issue because they tend to approach the product in a technocratic way rather than a, in a user empathic way. Uh, they tend to look at problems as not being a big deal because they figured out a workaround in five minutes. So they go, oh, it's not really a problem. I just found a workaround. So one of the things you have to do with them is to get them to have empathy for the poor users who are not programmers, who are not sysadmins, who uh, aren't going to open up a console and set a path variable to solve a problem and then say, see, it's not a problem. My wife isn't going to do that. <laughs> you know, my wife calls me whenever anything doesn't look the same as it looked yesterday in her Outlook toolbar. And then I have to fix it. Usually it's because she pressed on something she didn't mean to press, but she just completely shuts down. She can't use the computer if anything looks a little different. And if you don't know anybody who, who is not a computer person, uh, then it's, it's hard to, to realize how hard it is for certain people to deal with that situation. So, so a big agenda item for dealing with developers is uh, helping them have empathy for non-technical people. And one way you might do that is show them uh, non-technical people, talk about the kinds of things that non-technical people experience. Years ago at Apple Computer, we had a video that they showed us in the R&D group called the Out of the Box Experience. And it was showing people who had never used a co personal computer before was showing them trying to figure out how to use a Macintosh with no help. And it was very funny and weird. In one case, someone was using a mouse, but they were, she was using it upside down. So that every time she moved it one direction, it, the, the pointer would go the other way. And people just couldn't believe that she didn't know the right way to use a mouse, but it got us all thinking about how much we 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 don't realize people struggle with the things that we try to design for them and it, cre it increased the empathy i think uh that we had so that's one thing you got to do uh another thing is you've got to convince them that all of the knowledge that they have about the technology doesn't mean that they can just glance at a piece of software and say oh it obviously works uh, and that means you need to talk to them about famous bugs or bugs that have happened in your company where it sure looked like everything was fine and then it turned out it was not fine because you've got to wake the developers up to the possibility that even though they know so much about the technology, they can be fooled by that technology. 
And that's a big part of what makes testers special is that we have people who love testing, people who, who practice testing, we develop a sort of humility about what we know about a system. We know that no matter how good it looks, it might have a hidden terrible problem in it. And you've got to find a way to convey that to uh, developers. Now, it is a little different challenge if the developer wrote that software. So what I try to do if a developer wrote the software is I say, well, you know, you're kind of stuck in a way because you have to get some distance from it in order to imagine problems. If you're too close to it, it's very hard to separate yourself from that. And I know this because I myself am a developer and I have developed things that had serious problems that I couldn't myself see until I put the project aside for three weeks and then came back to it. And then, wow, then I realized that, that there was something fundamentally wrong with it that I didn't realize before. And I wished that I had a tester to help me with, uh, with my blind spots. But, you know, and the client didn't have someone test the stuff that I developed. I had to test it myself. So to, in order to, to create some distance, it helps to have a checklist of ideas. So one of the things I introduce to developers who test is the my heuristic test strategy model checklists. There's lots of these kinds of lists out there. Uh, there's something, there's a famous set of lists by a guy called the Brady Tester called the Yandy lists, for instance, which are ridiculously long lists of test ideas. Uh, Liz Hendrickson has a bunch of lists, and then I've got my heuristic test strategy model lists. And these lists kind of take you out of yourself and help remind you of different things that maybe you should be testing. So that's another way to try to, uh, to give some critical distance to developers. There are two things that I like. And by the way, I, I gave a talk about that. I think it was about, what was it, a month ago. Um, I gave two ideas other than what you were saying. The first one is basically to do pair testing. I think that if you have a developer team where those developers will be testers and will continue being testers, and, and very oh. important, they want to be testers because Great if someone idea. doesn't want to be testers and do it. So I, I said, you need to do pair testing. You do it twice, maybe. And these guys start, meaning it's not rocket science. We do it. So just show them how to do it twice. And then they basically hang on to it because these guys are usually smart, pretty smart. The second thing uh, that I like, and it goes very much around that is to create personas. Um, yeah. Go over personas, but don't stop on the user profile. Go to the human profile. Okay. And I like talking about my father. He's a great surgeon, very non-technical. So installing a printer for him, he will call my brother in New York or myself in Israel while he lives in Costa Rica. But again, give him a, a, a person that needs to be operated. He will do it blindfolded. So look into those aspects and it helps people to realize, basically to visualize how these guys are going to be working. Hey, this guy has problems looking from, I mean, these are old people. They need to have large fonts and stuff like that, or they're clumsy with their fingers. Even going as far as that will, will actually help when you're creating a persona profile. So those are the two things, very, very concrete. And I think that they're very, very useful when you're working with developers. Great ideas. Those are wonderful ideas. Cool. Uh, I was in a, in a hospital uh, a few weeks ago because my wife broke her ankle and the anesthesiologist told me to come in with. Okay, James is breaking off again. Wait, let's check if these are his two minutes. He had a nurse there. Wait, there wait, James, you broke up on the part where the anesthesiologist told you to come in and something. Hello? No. Wait, you broke up. I know, I'm breaking up and I, you're breaking. Wait, I don't know, am I there now? now? Yes. I hear no. you. You wanted to I be, hear you. You started the so story. A, Wait, you started yeah, story I, I, the part of the anesthesiologist. Yeah, the an anesthesiologist. Well, just imagine this. I'm sitting here in a room watching this anesthesiologist on one side of my wife's bed. 
On the other side was a nurse and an ultrasound device. And then there was a blood pressure monitor and the blood monitor was going beep, beep, beep. And the ultrasound was going boop, boop, boop. And he was looking at the ultrasound and he was telling the nurse to do this stuff over here. And then he says to the nurse to press the buttons on the, the ultrasound. And he had labeled the buttons with little labels that he put on himself because he wanted to make sure that she wouldn't make a mistake. And he says, press button one, button, and then he says, press the print button, and she did, and an error message came up. It said, printer offline, and he said, oh, it's not plugged in. And then this nurse is like stepping over cables and trying not to pull them out of the wall when she reaches down and she plugs it in. And I just realized this is the kind of thing, if you're gonna test the ultrasound device or you're gonna test the blood pressure monitor or you're gonna test the system, you got to imagine the chaos that might be surrounding the use of your product. And when you can do that, you're going to be much better at testing it. And that's especially important for developers to hear. Yeah, I, I remember a case when I, I was consulting for a firm that they were doing software for a bank. And they had the best software ever and they really liked it. They said that almost no bugs, maybe you can assume that. But then it got completely rejected because it was, we're talking about, 10 years ago, it was a software for a bank teller that used extensive use of the mouse. And if you remember back in the day, bank tellers work only with keyboards and they work really, really fast. And they wow. don't even know where the mouse is on their screen. Now today it might be a little bit different. But that's what a great story. That's so simple, <laughs> but it, it's yeah. so easy to imagine. And so <laughs> I, 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 that, that was a classic one and it's got stuck in my head. <laughs> Now, we have time for a last question, and I think this is an important one, at least for me. We have been talking a lot about exploratory testing, and we have been talking a lot about sessions, and one of the things that are, quote unquote, simpler with scripted testing is the concept of coverage done. I, I wrote down, I made a good effort, I wrote down, let's say, good enough test cases, used risk-based assessment, had all my scripts, and I know that I'm done because I covered everything that I had in there and I even made the tweaks. When we're working exploratory, how am I to explain people? First of all, you know what, let's take it in two realms. The first one, when am I done with my session? Where can I say that this specific charter I covered enough in order to move over to the next charter? And let's look at it on a macro level. I'm on the application. When have I run enough sessions and covered enough territory in order to say comfortably, I've done enough testing for this application. How do you approach that? Well, it's all based on mental models. So whenever I'm testing something, I have to have a model of it. And the model has to be in my mind. So for instance, if I'm testing a stapler and I have no idea what a stapler does, well then I can't answer the question about how much I've tested. I have no idea. I have no model in my mind of a stapler, but I do, I do know what a stapler does. I know that staplers have very restricted functionality. So since I have a model of, or once I have a model of the product in my mind, then it's like having a, it's like having a, a, a map of your own home in your mind. And you know the rooms in your home, and you know the little cubby holes where things can be. And when you search your home looking for your lost car keys or your lost wallet, you don't have any trouble saying, I've searched my home pretty thoroughly and I'm pretty sure that my car keys are not in my home. Now, you might be wrong, but nobody says, well, I have no idea what my coverage was. <laughs> well, did you search on your, in your kitchen table? Uh, yes, okay. Uh, then, uh, look again and uh, uh, is it possible that there could, could be underneath something uh, maybe on your bed uh, we all know how to search spaces like uh, the tops of desks and the tops of kitchen tables for objects that we are we are looking for nobody thinks that that's some kind of weird controversial thing but it really it's the same thing when we're testing. We construct in our minds a sense of what the spaces are that we could search, and we talk about what those spaces are. And in my way of thinking, I'm always gonna talk about data, data coverage, I'm gonna talk about function coverage, which is what the product does, 
I'm going to talk about structural coverage. That's what the product's made of. I'm going to talk about platform coverage. Now, I've just listed some things that are already in my heuristic software testing you know, uh, uh, yeah, it's, model. Yeah, it sounds like SF Depot. Right. That's, that's what it is. I've just designed this generic idea and then I apply it to every specific thing. But I'm, I'm always developing a model. Usually it's in a mind map form. Sometimes it's in a list form. Sometimes it's a set of post-its that I put up on the wall next to me. But I've got a, a, a layout of the kinds of things that I can do, the kinds of things that I can search. And so I come to the idea that I've done enough when I look at all that stuff and I say, is there anything else I can think of that – that uh, still needs to be done. And if I go, no, I have nothing else. And that doesn't mean that I have tested everything well enough. It means that I've gotten to a particular level. Now, if it's really important, like a medical device, something, something very, very important, I don't stop there. At that point, I'm going to bring in other people. I'm going to have them look at it. I'm going to have a brainstorming session. I'm going to use pairing. I'm going to talk to the developer. I'm going to read the code. I'm going to use lots of different ways, but that's only if it's very, very important. So you have to decide, is this thing so important that you need to use 17 different methods to make sure that you've done enough testing? Or Maybe it's not that important. Maybe you've done enough testing for now because maybe you have other things that you need to test. And on an Agile project, that's the more likely situation. So you just want to get to a point where you can say this. Here's the statement you want to be able to say to yourself. Have I done the testing that a reasonable person would have done? Or... Can someone look at my testing and say, that's crazy. You didn't even do this simple thing that everyone thinks that you have to do. Why didn't you do this obvious thing? You didn't use the sample data or you didn't even try to turn the product on. Or I, I, I think We're almost out of time, but I, I think that you pointed to something that it's a misconception of exploratory testing. And I think that, and we go back to, to your initial statement. Exploratory testing might be a little bit informal testing, but it doesn't mean that you're not planning ahead. You, no, you, yeah, absolutely. You, you started from a mental model, and if you're human like me, you will bring it down into a mind map or a list of things or, or post it notes, whatever right. you want to do, because you're not infallible, and you will, you will need to get that in order to make sure that you didn't, didn't miss anything. Just in the way that when you go to buy groceries, you make a list because you're going to forget the milk. So, right. Now, the, the thing is, the thing to remember is, most people who do highly scripted testing, they can't tell you if they've done enough testing because they don't really know how to think about it. They just say, well, I've got, a, I've got 500 test cases. That's all I can tell you. And I say, well, what are you covering in those 500 test cases? And they go, I don't know. Read all my test cases and then you'll know. So whether you're doing script testing or whether you're doing exploratory testing, you still need that central skill. That ability to conceive of the product, conceive of your test strategy, put it into words, think systematically about it. That's not an ET thing or a, a scripted testing thing. That's a testing thing. By and the way, we all have to practice it to get good at it. And one of the things that I, you talked about debriefing, I like to do pre-briefings of testing. Usually for, for junior testers or developers, it's a great way of Okay, so what are you planning to test? And you go over yeah. ideas, and, and it's a pre-briefing, and then you do a debriefing. Right. And obviously, you, with more experienced testers, you might skip that if you don't have the time, but I usually find right. it very, very good if you have the time. I agree. Uh, and, and again, it's a great idea. James, we're actually out of time. Time actually okay. flew because well, thanks it was for doing fun. this. It's been fun. Man, thanks a lot for everything here. Sorry for everyone that we didn't cover all the questions that you had, but hopefully, again, if you send them, we'll try to go over them in one way or another. Thanks. It's, James, it's been great. Thanks for taking the time to talk to us. And everyone else, thanks for, for being here. Okay, bye-bye. Bye, guys. Thank you very much.